you. Thank you for Thank agreeing you. to do this. As you see, I'm doing my homework here. <laughs> I have actually read it before <laughs> and, and greatly enjoyed it. Um, Alistair, for an apologist for religion, to be able to say that you once were an atheist gives you a certain amount of street cred, which not everybody can boast. Could you tell me a bit about your, your journey from that position to where you are now? Well, I think when I was growing up in Northern Ireland, uh, I did feel very strongly that um, religion was something that caused violence and difficulties. And certainly, I think growing up in Northern Ireland, you could see how easy that would have been to be the case. And back in the 1960s, of course, Everybody was a Marxist, and I followed that intellectual fashion. And it just seemed entirely reasonable to adopt an atheist approach. And of course, at the time, I was studying natural sciences, wanting to go and study chemistry at Oxford. And again, it just seemed to me that the sciences and atheism almost, if you like, rolled into each other in a very intellectually satisfying way. I think when I arrived at Oxford, I began to rethink things. I began to realize they weren't perhaps as straightforward as I thought. And certainly it was at that point that I really began to feel that Christianity offered a better way of seeing things and making sense of things than I'd imagined in the past. All right, thank you. Um, this is sort of coming to the end of a fairly long period of interviewing people. And in America and in Israel, uh, I've interviewed some fairly, what should we say, odd bedfellows of yours. <laughs> and I, I sort of feel I ought to give you the opportunity to say something reasonable, because um, I've interviewed people who said, I'll believe in evolution when I see a monkey give birth to a, to a man, or uh, I've interviewed somebody who thought that it was right that adulteresses should be stoned to death. I mean, how do you feel about being, in a sense, in the same camp as people like that? I think uh, any member of a group, whether it's religious or anti-religious, obviously finds themselves in, in company that they might feel at times rather uneasy about. For example, um, many atheists would be alarmed at some of the violent ideas you find in other atheists. And I certainly do find myself concerned about some of the more extreme views, some of the more violent views I find amongst uh, religious believers. And certainly I would want to try and emphasize the fact that Christianity is a rational faith, that it certainly uh, believes very strongly in God, but it also believes that we can make sense of the world and therefore to engage in dialogue with people like you is immensely important, partly because it advances understanding, but also because in principle it is extremely important to be critiqued by people with alternative viewpoints in case we've missed something. Yes. Well, I've been trying to engage in mm. dialogue and repeatedly was brought up short by the fact that there was no dialogue to be had because at some point the trump card of faith is produced, and there is no arguing with that. Now, uh, I know that in, in this book, uh, you take me to task for my, uh, as you think, misunderstanding of faith, and I wonder if we could talk about that a bit. Um, I have said that faith is not based upon evidence, but is what you need when there isn't any evidence. And as soon as there's any evidence, then you don't need faith anymore. And you have possibly rightly criticized me for uh, not taking sufficient account of the way Christians have actually defined faith. And I understand that. I understand that uh, the way Christians define faith does not correspond to the way I define faith. However, I don't understand where you're coming from when you do say something like faith is based upon reason. I mean, what kind of reason, what kind of evidence do you use to support your faith? Well, I think that's a very fair question. And certainly, I'd want to say immediately that we're talking about a slightly different situation than, for example, evidence that the moon orbits the Earth at a certain distance. I think that one of the big questions one has when one tries to make sense of anything that is big, for example, what is the meaning of life, why are we here, things like that, is that there are many explanations. And inevitably, this means we have to try to do what Gilbert Harmon described as in fair to the best explanation. In other words, there are many possible ways of explaining this. We have to make that very difficult judgment, which is actually the best of these. And the real difficulty I find, and certainly I appreciate your concern at this point, is that evidence takes us thus far, 
But then when it comes to deciding between a number of competing explanations, it is extremely difficult to have an evidence-driven argument for those final stages. So what I'd want to say is that I believe faith is rational in the sense that it tries to make the best possible sense of things. But in the end, it, it has to move beyond that saying, even though we believe this is the best way of making sense of things, we can't actually prove this is the case. And therefore, although I believe faith is rational in the sense that it gives the best possible case it can give, there is a point in which it goes beyond the evidence. And it's at that point, I think, that your concern that it might be irrational, I think, comes into play. I suppose I would say that at that point where mm. it goes beyond the evidence, that's when it becomes faith. And before that, it isn't faith at all. It's, it's uh, using evidence in the proper way that evidence should be used. I think I, I take your point. I think what I'd want to say is that evidence perhaps leads to some probabilistic judgment. There is a possibility there might be a God. Um, but the question is, how do we actually confirm that? Yeah. And there is a sense in which I think one has to say, uh, in the end, we have to make a decision of some sort. There is none we can't make a decision, or there is a God. And in the end, I think that means stepping out in a degree of faith, whether that is to say there is no God and we'll act on that basis, or whether we decide there is a God and we'll try and act on that basis. Right, I'm glad you said I mean, I quite agree with you. Mm. We want to talk probabilities. Yes. Uh, neither of us mm. can say with certainty, 100% mm. certain or, or 0% certain. So we do need to talk probabilities. Mm. There is a tendency for some people to say... Of course, I totally agree with you. We've got to talk probabilities. Nobody can be certain one way or the other. I think there is a tendency for people to say something like this. You cannot disprove the existence of God. Therefore, that immediately jumps us to 50-50, as though there was some sort of even-steven um, probability, uh, b simply because you can neither prove nor disprove. And I think we'd both agree that we don't want to jump to 50-50, that there are all sorts of probabilities that lie between 0 and 100, and which are not necessarily 50. Now, my attempt to get there uh, is another thing that you've criticized quite strongly. And that is to say that there is an inherent improbability in living things, in the complexity of living things, the, the statistical improbability of living things. It's something, after all, that creationists from, from Paley down have played upon. And I want to say exactly the same thing of a designer, a designer of any kind, uh, because it seems to me that any entity, any being capable of designing a universe or an eye or a knee would have to be the kind of entity, I don't know in detail of course, but would have to be the kind of entity which would be statistically improbable in the same kind of way as the eye is. You strongly object to that, apparently on the grounds that Christian theologians don't say that. And I accept maybe they don't. But my question is, why don't they? Well, I think there's some very good points being made here. I mean, certainly I wouldn't say that simply because uh, there is a possibility there may be God and a possibility there may not be God. It's a 50 50 situation. I think that we are in a situation of when we cannot actually prove something decisively either way, we do have to try and make a judgment to the best of our abilities and what the probabilities are. But I think we need to say that um, you can make a probable judgment cognitively. In other words, I think the evidence points this way, but existentially I feel I can commit myself to this. So I think there's a tension between the probabilistic side of things and being able to actually live a life as a response to that. But then you make a good point, which I think is that uh, this therefore raises the question of the extreme improbability of God. And certainly you've made that point well in your writings. I think one of the responses I would want to make, though, would be this. Um, perhaps God is extremely improbable. I mean, it is very difficult to actually um, arrive at a, an agreement on what this might be. But in the end, I think the ultimate question is going to be improbable or probable. The real question is, is there a God? And I think that that is one of the problems I find, that the, there is a limit to the, 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 there's a limit to the position to which probabilistic arguments can take us. In that, in one sense, statistically, you and I are very improbable, and yet we're both here having this very interesting conversation. And so in one sense, there is this very difficult judgment about, given the fact that it may be improbable, does that actually mean that this is not the case? We are indeed very, very mm. improbable. 
because we're so improbable mm. and all the rest of living things are improbable, we desperately need an explanation which explains that improbability. Now, as you know, evolution by natural selection does exactly that. It does indeed start from very, very simple beginnings, maybe not ultimately simple, but at least much, much simpler beginnings than anything which is produced. And the elegance of the theory is that over millions, billions of years, you get a gradual mounting up of the staircase of improbability. And it all happens gradually. It never makes too, too big demands, too formidable demands upon our um, credulity. The sudden conjuring into existence of you or me, or any part of us, would indeed make unreasonable demands on our concept of chance. It couldn't happen. We really, really need a theory which starts from simplicity and makes complexity, makes improbability by gradual degrees. That, as we both agree, is what evolution does. Now, the point where we seem to slightly part company is that I think the same must apply to God. Now, you've said correctly that I can't put a figure on it. I can't put a figure on the eye either. Mm. But everybody agrees intuitively that the eye is far too improbable to have suddenly jumped into existence. And I want to say the same about God, and you don't, and I don't understand why not. I think we have a very interesting disagreement. <coughs> I'm sorry. <coughs> I'll try and recap from my... I think we have a very interesting disagreement here. And one of the points I'd like to try and make is that though it's difficult to understand, that in one sense the Christian understanding of God is above rather than within the natural process. And therefore, for me, God is not so much someone who needs to be explained as someone who actually gives a ground of explanation. And so, going back to the, this whole question of how we arrive at any decision about this, uh, I often go back to C.S. Lewis, who once wrote, I believe in Christianity as I believe the sun has risen. Not simply because I see it, but because by it, I see everything else. And Lewis's point there, which I think I find quite persuasive, is that belief in a God actually gives you a, a way of seeing the world, which actually makes an awful lot of sense of it. Now, you'd rightly come back and say, well, you know, that, that, that does not prove anything, and I, I concede that point. But nevertheless, I believe that one of the questions we have to face here is what worldview, what way of seeing things actually enables to, us to make most sense of what we see around us and the implications for our lives. And so in that sense, I'd want to say that I invoke God not as something within the natural order, but rather as something that actually makes more sense of the natural order than otherwise might be the case. Mm. Sounds a bit to me like a sort of intellectual conjuring trick. I mean, you kind of conceded the point, but then said, well, if you believe in God, it illuminates everything else. And I could well imagine, for example, that it doesn't just illuminate the natural world for you, but illuminates a kind of internal world where you, where you feel... Uh, a, a subjective awareness which, uh, which um, you can make sense of by assuming God. However, I, I think that's moderately weak, and it's even weaker when you're talking about the natural world, because you're still left with, with my point that it's not just that you, you, we don't need God in, in order to explain the natural world, but he's positively improbable for exactly the same reason as the sudden conjuring into existence of an eye is improbable. So what I'm saying is that the argument of the creationists, and I know you're not one of them, but, the, but their argument mm. actually backfires very badly because um, the, the ultimately complex entity, and he has to be even more complex if he's going to do the rest of what you require him to do, which is to illuminate your path, illuminate your internal um, feelings, to say nothing of answering prayers and forgiving sins and all that kind of thing, plus making a universe, he's really got to be far, far more complicated than an eye. And therefore, it's not just that we don't need him to explain the world because we've got evolution. He is improbable for exactly the same reason as the sudden, in as a sudden jumping into existence of living complexity was improbable before we understood Darwinism. I mean, if you believed in a God who evolved, I'd be much happier if you said, well, somewhere out in Alpha Centauri, there's a superior form of life which is so immensely superior to us that we would call it God, and maybe it even seeded life here, and maybe it, maybe it beams um, rays here to, to 
uh, protect us and forgive our sins and all that sort of thing. I'd be much happier with that because I could then say, ah, well, the God actually evolved and therefore we are no longer bereft of an explanation for his existence. But I don't think you do believe that. Well, I think you've made some very interesting points. And again, just going... Oh, yeah, I'm so sorry. I think there's some very interesting points there. I think the first point I'd want to, to make simply is this. I mean, it's not as if I, I believe in God because I think he's a good explanation. It's that actually I, I believe in God for a number of reasons, and I find there's this explanatory bonus to us. In other words, that, that believing in God does give me a way of making sense of things, even though I don't actually think that's the primarily important thing about him. But then you, you make some very interesting points, again, about the uh, complexity of God, about uh, where God comes from, and so on. And again, those are our significant points which must be talked about. But one of the observations I've made is that um, in talking to natural scientists, I mean, if we look at the split between religious believers and those who, who don't believe, I mean, it's roughly 50-50, with obviously a number undecided. And so I, I think I would have to say I don't find the case for atheism compelling on the grounds of natural science at all. I think the issue, if you put, as you put, of where God comes from is a very significant question. But from a Christian perspective, that, that isn't really the question that is to be asked. The idea is that God was there before everything, and in some way God makes things uh, in some way. And as a result of that is the ground of explanation. But as a Christian, I don't need to invoke God to explain why uh, this TV camera works, why things fall from the, from the earth uh, in certain ways. It's much more I understand God to have made a framework which actually is regular and can be understood. And therefore, actually, in one sense, we have this very interesting historical observation that in some way Christianity may have catalyzed the emergence of the natural sciences by stressing the regularity of the created order, and thus it's, it's in fact, it's so amenable to scientific investigation and scientific explanation. That, of course, could be a historically valid point, and I don't know enough history mm. to, to judge. Um, when you say God didn't come into existence but was always there. I find that not really very helpful because, uh, I mean, suppose I go back to my problem of explaining the eye. It would be no kind of answer to say, oh, well, the eye was always there. Uh, it would still be something that requires explanation in the sense that anything statistically improbable does. So I don't think you could get away with it with an eye. And I don't really see why you can get away with it with God. I mean, I know that there are other theologians who have attempted to say, to, to, to deny the proposition that God is complex at all. I mean, there have been some theologians have suggested that God is ultimately simple. And uh, th that, that would be fine in, as far as explaining his existence is concerned. I could easily believe that an ultimately simple God's always existed. But then he would not be capable of doing what we expect of him, uh, which is setting up the laws of the universe, and as I said before, to say nothing of all the things like listening to prayers, uh, which, are, uh, uh, which require a different order of, of, co of complexity, but cer certainly can't be done by anything that's ultimately simple. Again, you've raised some very interesting questions. And again, you, you've highlighted some tensions inside Christian theology. And certainly, the way of approaching things that I would want to adopt would be this, not to begin with a a predetermined or preconceived idea of God. God must be simple or God must be complex, but rather to try and infer what God must be like on the basis of what God has done or in terms of what God has revealed himself to be. And thus, I, I think that the, the points you make actually might be um, driven to some extent by a preconceived idea of what God must be like. But I think the, the, the whole issue of, of, of the, the emergence of time and so forth does raise some very, very difficult questions. I mean, a perfectly reasonable uh, point we might discuss is um, where was the universe before it actually began? Because certainly, I think the issue here is simply the capacity of the human mind to comprehend some extremely counterintuitive ideas. And I certainly have difficulties in relation to some of these in thinking about God, but I notice they are also there in standard physical accounts of how the universe actually came into being, which require us to think of a time when there was no universe, or indeed think of modern cosmological theories, think of the universe expanding into, well, well something. It, it's in a very very, very difficult idea to grasp, but for that reason is not wrong. I agree with that, and I, I, I totally agree with you that there's deep, deep mystery at the base of the universe, uh, 
and uh, physicists know this as well as anybody. The questions like what, if anything, was there before time began. Perhaps it's because I am a biologist who has been impressed through my whole career by the power of evolution that the one thing I would not be happy about accepting in those deeply mysterious preconditions of the universe is anything complex. I could easily imagine um, something very hard to understand at the base of the universe, at the base of the laws of physics, and of course they are very hard to understand. But the one thing that seems to me clearly doesn't help is to postulate anything in the nature of a complicated intelligence. There are lots of things that would help, uh, and physicists are working on them, and theories of everything and that kind of thing. But a theory which begins by postulating a deliberate conscious intelligence seems to me to have sold the past right before you even start, because that's, what, that's one of the things that science has so triumphantly explained. Science hasn't triumphantly explained yet the origin of the universe. But I feel, I have a very strong intuition, and I wish I could persuade you of it, that science is not going to be helped by invoking conscious, deliberate intelligence. Whatever else preceded the universe, whatever, whatever that might mean, it is not going to be the kind of thing which designs anything, let alone the kind of thing which dies for people's sins. I think one point I, I want to try and make here is that it is extremely difficult to extrapolate into the very distant past and actually work out what must have happened. I mean, certainly I understand the Darwinian paradigm and so forth. And yet in one sense, I think that, that religion is primarily concerned not so much with explanation of origins, but much more with the way things are now. How can we give an account of them? And above all, I think, how we should live, how we should think in the present. And I think that an appeal to how things came into being is actually a, a relatively small part of that. It may become significant for polemical reasons, but actually in terms of the, the constructive way in which religious people think about the world, really the primary emphasis is not so much on looking backwards as looking at things as they are right now and trying to say what is the best way of making sense of these things how should we live what is a, a way of thinking a way of acting that really gives us an understanding of the way things are but also a reason to live a reason to hope a reason to die and so forth yes uh, and uh, of course we all want um, those things and we all want to discuss morality the right way to live but Religion does make claims about existence which don't seem to me to be essential for the moral good life that you're talking about and uh, Christianity might very well be a, a guide for a good life but, or, or indeed Judaism might be or Islam might be uh, but I can't see how that has any bearing upon the existence claims and maybe you're almost saying that doesn't matter to you that that's a less important thing than the way things are now and the way we ought to live now. Um, from what you were saying before, I could imagine that you, you would be uh, some sort of a deist, some sort of a, a, um, a, a, a believer in, a, in an ultimate prime mover, although I would depart from you there as well. But I don't understand why you're a Christian. I mean, what, that Christianity has got an enormous amount added onto that, as you've just, just implied. Um, the idea of redemption, the idea of atonement, uh, the idea of original sin, um, the idea of forgiveness, the idea of prayer. These things have seemed to have no substantiating basis at all, and yet you've grafted them on. One, one would be tempted to say, for no better reason than that that's the way you happen to have been brought up. Well, I think you've raised a very important question, and it really allows me, I think, to be able to amplify some of the things I've been saying thus far. I think what I'd want to say is that, in the end, one of the key reasons why I believe in God has to do with Jesus. And therefore, for a Christian, one of the central themes is going to be what actually happened in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus, and what is its meaning? 
Because for Christians, it's not simply abstract thinking about a God. I mean, I believe in a God very, very strongly. But the reason I believe in God is not reflection on the way the world is, or indeed sort of theoretical reflection on the idea of God. There's actually this very focused concentration on the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. Because in that, I see something which really holds the key to everything. And for me, if, if I may just overstate very slightly, one of the key reasons for Christians believing in God is actually Jesus, because we see there something which demands explanation. And that really, I think, is the ultimate ground of faith for a Christian, rather than more abstract reflection about God. Now, you rightly then make points about me uh, possibly adding on things about redemption, original sin, and so forth. But actually, I would say I don't. In fact, these are all core ideas. And in fact, that in one sense, the idea I add on is not so much Jesus' life, death, resurrection, the idea of forgiveness, the idea of Jesus' um, uh, relevance for us, but actually that the explanatory capacity of the idea of God, for me, emerges from this. I then bring that to bear on the sciences, but it's not actually the primary reason why I believe in God. If you like, it's a, a very significant and very welcome addition, but it is not the primary focus in my view. If you like, Christianity is not so much about explanation, but about salvation. But it turns out that the Christian vision of salvation does have explanatory implications. But the evidence for the life of Jesus and what he did, historically speaking, is remarkably thin. Wouldn't, I mean, Modern theologians surely agree about that, don't they? Well, I think that, that there are obvious questions about how we can have reliable historical knowledge about such a distant figure. And yet the New Testament dates from remarkably close to the time of Jesus, much closer than, for example, standard Roman biographies of emperors. And anyway, it's not so much really the details of the biography. It is the way in which Jesus' life was perceived to have certain significance by his first followers, which resonated with their experience and moved forwards from there. And so I think we're dealing with something which actually was seen to be significant and was seen to be capable of transforming people's lives. Now, obviously, the point you'd want to make is this must be interrogated concerning its reliability. But certainly as you read the New Testament and the early history of Christianity, you can see people convinced that something of decisive importance has happened, which has the capacity not simply to transform their lives, but also to explain what they see in the world around them. Right. Um, obviously one of those central points is the idea of original sin and redemption. As I understand it, sin is supposed to have been, in some sense, paid for by the death of Jesus, the torture and death of Jesus. Someone coming to that from outside might think it was a really rather unpleasant doctrine because we, we, we have the idea of punishment as a way of expiating sin, which is, has some unpleasant aspects to it. It also has the idea of punishing somebody else for the sins that he didn't commit. It has the idea of, at least in some theologies, punishing him for a sin which was committed by a man, Adam, who didn't even exist. In other theologies, it, it includes the idea of expiating sins which have yet to be committed in the future, whether or not we future people choose to commit them. Uh, and finally, one's left with a sort of slightly mischievous feeling, well, who was he trying to impress anyway? Because after all, if he was one of the manifestations of God, if he wanted to forgive us our sins, why didn't he just forgive them instead of going through all that self-torture? I think you've raised a lot of questions there, and you rightly said theologians differ slightly. The point I'd want to make would be this, that um, what Christianity is saying is that there seems something wrong with human nature, that we possess, we just don't possess the capacity to transform ourselves, that in some way, in order to um, experience and enter into the redeemed life, something has to be done for us. It's a question of not having the adequate resources to actually transform ourselves to be saved. And therefore the Christian understanding is that in some way, the life and above all the death and resurrection of Jesus are the basis for this transformation. Now obviously theologians disagree, but a very key theme is that in some way, by entering into the world in Christ, God is demonstrating our, the extent to which we have wandered from him, and also his, his yearning or longing that we should actually come back to him. 
So for me, the death of Christ is, is about God demonstrating love for us, bringing home to us how far we are from us, but also, if you like, making, making it possible for us to return to him, to relate to him, with the removal of barriers such as sin or guilt which stand in his way. And so for that reason, Christians have very often rightly, I think, thought of, of the death and resurrection of Christ as being right at the center of the Christian faith, because it is at this point, if you like, that this great act of redemption has taken place, and which we're being asked to respond to in some way. But it's almost as though you're slipping away from the factual veracity of this and erecting the death of Jesus as almost a kind of poetic, symbolic act. Uh, and I've noticed a tendency for theologians to do that a lot and to sort of almost say, oh, we don't care what really happened. What matters is the symbolic meaning. It's almost as though if, say, at some future date, the double helix model of DNA were ever to be disproved, uh, and then if, if scientists had become so religiously committed to the idea of the double helix that they would say something like, oh, we don't care whether it's actually true that it's a double helix, but what meaning does the double helix have for us today? Perhaps the affinity of the bases for each other, the purine for the pyrimidine, the way the double helix coils round itself is kind of, has meaning for us in terms of a loving relationship. You, you get the point. I mean, um, doesn't it actually rather matter that this man was tortured and killed for somebody else's sins when he, if he was God, he had the power simply to forgive them or perform some other symbolic act rather than, than actually be crucified in this horrendous way. I think for Christians, the, the events you've described, the actualities, are immensely important. But I think every event, every event actually needs to be interpreted. In other words, this has happened, was it significant? For example, um, Caesar crossing the Rubicon is actually more than just a general crossing a river. It is an act of declaration of war against Rome because of its significance. And therefore, what Christians have tried to do is to say there are these events, and here are their significance. So the event, if you like, is the death of Jesus on the cross. Its significance is the demonstration of God's love, the transformation of the human situation, the forgiveness of sins, and so forth. And certainly I wouldn't want to minimize for one moment the, the pain that Christ suffered, the apparent torture, as you rightly say, he went through. And from a Christian perspective, that is not about glorifying torture. It's not about in any way saying, let's do to other people what they did to Jesus. It's much more saying, look, in Christ we see God entering into the world at its darkest parts. The worst that the world could do at the punishment of Christ, his rejection, his torture, his agony, his death, and so on, then in some sense God entered into those darkest parts of the world in order to redeem it. And certainly, uh, you mentioned earlier I might have been a deist. I, I think, I, I hope I'm not, because a deist would simply take the view that God is up there looking down on things, perhaps benignly. But the kind of God I believe in is a God who actually enters into this world, takes on it, it, this world at its worst, in order to try and transform it. And that really is part of this gospel of redemption, that in some way God shows to enter this world to bring about its transformation through Christ. I understand what, what you believe. I wish I understood why. Thank you very much. I, I think, uh, do. Uh, the question of... If, if you feel it flows, I'm, I'm very happy to take it. You said you're not a deist, but a, a Christian. There are, of course, other ways of departing from being a deist. You could be a Jew, you could be a Muslim, you could be a Hindu. Um, they're all different, and they differ in many of the, exactly the kinds of details that you are, feel so strongly about. How do you know that the particular faith in which you happen to have been brought up is the right one, rather than just the sort of abstract God of the physicists, which we were talking about earlier, which, which doesn't make all these additional claims? Why Christianity? Well, I certainly uh, began as an atheist, and therefore when I began to be convinced of, of the truth of um, Christianity, it wasn't so much a question of, um, you know, I've been brought up in this way. It was much more this seemed to me to be the right way. I think part of it is the fact that Christianity offers an explanation not simply the way the world is, but also why there are alternative ways of looking at other religions. 
And certainly if we take someone like J.R.R. Tolkien, well known for his Lord of the Rings, his point is that we all tell stories to try and make sense of things. And all of these, if you like, are grasping after truth and some of them realize some of it. But his point is there are shadows there amidst the light. And Tolkien's argument, which I personally find very helpful, is that Christianity offers the narrative, the way of looking at things, which actually in some way brings to fulfillment what we find in other faiths. And so I'd want to treat other faiths with the greatest of respect, but hold personally that what I see in them that is good is brought to fulfillment in Jesus Christ. For that reason, I'd want to dialogue with them, to learn from them, but above all to say that in my view, these reach their fulfillment in the Christian revelation. Well, I hope they would want to dialogue with you. What about... What about the problem of evil? What about the fact that there is so much suffering in the world? People say, obviously you'll think naively, and I, I haven't said it, but people will say things like, you know, where was God in the tsunami? Um, where, where was God in the New Orleans hurricane, etc.? I think Christian theologians, in looking at natural disasters, suffering and so forth, have tended to take two approaches. One is to say, let's try and explain this. And uh, that, that, I think, doesn't really get us very far because we can't really make sense of these things. Maybe this is just the way things are. But the other approach they have used, I think, is much more important as to say that we need to cope with suffering. That in effect, the real issue is not so much how we make sense of this, but given that people are suffering, what may be said, what may be done to actually make that more bearable. And certainly the Christian view is that of a God who knows suffering at first hand, who's been here before us, who's experienced the worst that the world can throw at in the life and death of Jesus Christ. And I certainly do find that consoling. It also animates me to want to try and do something about those who are suffering at this moment. So it's not simply a question of intellectual reflection. It's about wanting to try and get out there and do something because I believe that is what God would want me to do. When you read of tens of thousands of people being killed, drowned, or blown away, whatever it is, and then you read that one child was saved, and the parents have thanked God for saving this one child, doesn't the irony of it strike you? I mean, that, that, that God could have saved all those 10,000 people. Why would he save this, this one child? I mean, I, I, I would hope that he would say he didn't save the one child. The one child was just lucky. But there are many people whose faith in God, almost unbelievably, I find, is increased when there's a disaster of this kind, rather than being decreased. I mean, can you get your head around that? I think I'd love to be able to explore the question of whether the world could be made in a different way, so we don't have these seismic shifts. Could we make a world where there weren't these things? Could we make a world in which these shifts didn't take place with resulting tidal waves and so forth? I don't know the answer to that question, but it's a very significant question all the same. But in response to your question about uh, a child being saved, I think one of the most fundamental instincts in human nature is to want to give thanks for things that happen that they believe to be good things. And certainly I fully take your point that it seems ironic that when many have died we should be thankful for one being saved. And yet for the parents in question, that would unquestionably be something they felt overwhelmed by and it would be the most natural thing in the world for them to want to give thanks that their child had been saved. Of course, and, and I mean, I, I would agree with that. I would agree that the psychological benefit of that is huge. But would you, as a detached scholar and theologian, would you want to say God saved that one child? I would want to say that God saved that one child. I would also want to say that the parents in question were right to give thanks for that. But I, I would therefore not want to say, I think, that God was in some way responsible for what happened elsewhere. I'd want to say that rather the limitations of the way the world is lead us to the point where this happened in the first place. In other words, that uh, you know, the, the key question is, could a world be made in which these volcanoes do not erupt, in which there is no shifting of plates, where there are no tidal waves? And that, I think, is not a question about God. I think it's a question about the way things are. I can't help feeling you're painting yourself into a rather awkward corner here, because um, on the one hand, you're, you're, you're saying, well, these are plate tectonic events, and could one imagine a world that didn't have um, plates drifting around and therefore the occasional earthquake and tsunami, and perhaps you can't. But if God has the power to, I mean, I thought to be consistent, you would say 
no, the plate tectonics is part of God's creation. God is a, is a, um, a, a creator of a world, a universe in which plate tectonics is part of it. And therefore, he can't change that and wouldn't wish to. It would be almost undignified. It would almost be a kind of blasphemy to go in there and start messing around with the, this perfect creation which he's, which he's made. But then you suddenly say, well, he saved the one child. I mean, that seems to me to be completely to undermine the uh, rather loftily but consistently um, reasonable position that you, that you come to about the way the world is, is made. You're suddenly backtracking and saying, oh, but he can just reach out and pick out one child and, 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 and save that, that one child. How do you reconcile that? I think a lot of debate about the whole question of suffering and so forth involves saying, here is the world we know. Now, here is another world in which these things don't happen. And there is this idea that somehow that imaginary world can be used as a way of judging this world. And certainly we find that in both Christian and indeed atheist writings. I want to say that the world as we know it is the only one we have to compare it with. And therefore, we might theoretically reflect on whether there could indeed be a better world where these things don't happen. But we have the way the world is. If there is a better world, I don't know what it is. And I don't necessarily believe there could be one, which is why I don't have any difficulty in accepting that God made the world as it is. But my key point is that when faced with suffering, we are dealing not with a God who stands up in distant isolation or somehow just says, oh, that's just too bad, but a God who has entered into this world, who has experienced its pain, who, who knows what it is like to lose a son. And for Christians, that's immensely important because it means that God is one who doesn't just be a, a compassionate, distant spectator of what's going on, but one who has been here before us and thus people can turn to with confidence, knowing that God understands what they are going through. Mm. I almost get the impression you're not interested in the question of did God reach out and pluck that child. I mean, it's almost as though you're constantly concerned with the psychological impact with the with the symbolism, and yet you did say you thought that God saved that one child, and that, I still repeat the question, it really does seem to me to contradict the very reasonable thing you said before, and just now again, that the world is the world, and you, you would not expect God necessarily to be able to, to interfere. I mean, uh, let me put another example. Um, at the time of the 9-11 uh, atrocities, uh, one of the planes didn't make it to its target and crashed into a field and it later emerged that some of the passengers had probably been wrestling with the crew, and that's why the thing. The wife of one of those men, they learned about it on mobile phones, said that she felt that her husband, who had been wrestling with the, with the hijackers, was God's instrument in stopping the plane crashing into whatever its target was, might have been the White House. And my friend in America who sent me that bit of information said, I thought very reasonably, if God wanted to stop that happening, why didn't he just give the hijackers a heart attack or something? Why did he have to do it in this extraordinarily roundabout way where, where passengers went and wrestled with the crew and the plane crashed, killing everybody on board, and two other planes, three other planes, um, met their, their targets? I, I feel you're being extraordinarily inconsistent in... in well, maybe you don't agree with her, but it sounds similar to, to what you were saying about the child rescued from the, from the tsunami inconsistent in, on the one hand, saying the world is the world, it runs the way it is because God made it that way and he can't just interfere capriciously and arbitrarily. But on the other hand, you are allowing him to interfere capriciously and arbitrarily. And even if you don't, which I think you do, uh, lots of other people do believe that. And it does reinforce their faith. Every time there's a major catastrophe like this, people's faith in God goes up. I find that totally bizarre. Well, I don't think you should. I mean, I think that one of the reasons why people believe in God even more after natural disasters is because basically it strips away a whole le series of levels of assurance about the way the world is. People begin to realize how dangerous the world is. And thus a whole series of fundamental questions are raised about what is the ultimate ground of my security? If there were to be a tidal wave tomorrow, well, what would I depend on? What is the ultimate reason for being here? Who can I turn to in these very, very desperate moments?
And it's not simply a sort of primitive superstition, let's turn to God. It is rather that the act of turning to God is found to actually provide the solace and transformation and consolation that people are looking for. Now, we haven't talked about Karl Marx very much, but one of the points he made, which was a critique of religion, is that it offers people this consolation in moments of great desperation and great unhappiness. And that, I think, is an extremely important point here, that actually this changes people's lives. Now, you're right in making the point there are some theoretical difficulties here, and I agree with that. But I'm noticing in particular the much greater truth that religion is able to meet people where they are and actually deal with those concerns that really meet them. Now, going back to your earlier point about, for example, the 9-11 thing, one of the standard Christian ideas is that God doesn't do things directly himself. He tends to delegate to others. And certainly one of the leading themes of Christian spirituality is what should I be doing to serve God? What is, what is it he wants me to do? And therefore, I personally wouldn't have difficulty in understanding what those passengers on that plane were doing. I mean, what they were saying, in effect, is, you know, if, if I wrestle these people to the ground and this plane crashes and I die too, well, uh, I believe a greater good will come out of it. Because if this thing crashes where they want it to crash, so much more damage is going to be do, done. And so I, I think that there is this issue of simply wrestling with this question, what is it that God wants me to do? And in that case, I think, these people clearly felt this was the right thing to do and believed they had done the right thing. I'm sure they did, and, and I, I'm sure it was the mm. right thing to do. I have no problem with that at all. The problem I have is with the man's wife saying that he was the instrument of God. If he was the instrument of God, why didn't God just tweak the steering wheel of the plane or, or, or do something else that in his omnipotence he presumably could do. It's one thing to say this man was a courageous man who decided the best thing to do was to wrestle the, the, the hijackers, even if it meant crashing, which of course it did. Uh, that is entirely understandable. That's a rational calculation. Uh, it's a calculation I like to think I might have done myself. But the calculation that says he was the instrument of God, whereas God, you might think, would have used a much more humane instrument if he was capable of doing it. I mean, what it looks like to me is that the world is precisely the way it would look if there were no guiding spirit, no God, nothing controlling it. Bad things happen, good things happen, and there's nothing we, we can say to explain why bad luck happens to some people rather than others. It just happens that way. Uh, that's the way the world looks like to me, and I I understand the consolation point you're making. Of course people can get consolation from it. What I don't understand is how a sophisticated, rational thinking man like you can buy that stuff. Well, I think I buy that stuff, to use your language, because I believe it to be right. And I believe it to be right partly because of rational reflection on the way the world is, which incidentally leads us to no firm conclusions. I think that one of the real difficulties is those of us who are atheists and those who are Christians and those who are others actually have looked at the world and probably reflected on it for a very long time, but actually have come to different conclusions. And in many ways, what I'm saying simply is that I believe the Christian way of looking at the world does make sense of most things, even though there are obviously gaps in our understanding. But going back to the point you made earlier, I mean, why didn't God just take the steering wheel, whatever you call it, an aeroplane and change things? Well, that has been a constant issue down the ages, as you will know. And Christians understand God to have made the world in a certain way that has, if you like, a framework, but actually does not directly intervene. And of course, the classic example of this is the crucifixion. You know, people were screaming at Jesus, you know, if there is a God, well, why didn't he just take you away from there? Why didn't you get down from there? And of course, that really reminds us that we're dealing with a God here who does not intervene directly in the world as we might hope. Certainly, there may be occasions when that happens, but the predominant pattern is that of us having to get on with things, being encouraged by and nourished by what we know God wants us to do, what God has done in Christ. But there's no quick fix of God just uh, intervening rather like some kind of nanny and stopping us doing things. One of the things we have to learn is that this world's a dangerous place and we learn the most difficult lessons through the hardest way, which is by being exposed to them. And certainly, if you look at writers like Voltaire, they will say, well, you know, uh, maybe there is a God who could take all these things away and we live in a sort of rather pampered way where nothing ever happens to us, but that actually isn't really living. I understand every word of what you've just said, and it's, I, I respect it totally. What, what I'm worried about is the inconsistency of what you've just said with what you said when I asked you whether God saved that child, because it seemed to me that by answering yes to that question, you precisely were admitting that God does intervene as a nanny from time to time. 
he chooses to sometimes and he doesn't choose to other times. Why don't you just say he doesn't intervene at all? Then I would understand exactly what you're saying, but you seem to me to be inconsistent and sort of jumping about in your answers. Um, sometimes you say that God doesn't intervene and, and you make a very eloquent case for why it would be a, a rather undignified sort of thing to do as a, as a God. On the other hand, you say he does intervene um, when he rescues one child from an earthquake. I think I've been over this ground. Do you want to re I think we've covered this to some extent. Well, have you? Because Just I, wondering... Um, uh, well, I mean, you... But, but I haven't quite got it. I haven't quite got it myself. Okay. Re Reformulate it. it, it it's con it, it's yes. concentrating on this one child. Is what concentrating on this one child. Yeah. Okay, yeah. right. So we're focusing on that one situation. Really. Yeah. I think that uh, in the case of, for example, a child surviving where tens of thousands, others did not, then clearly, what, you know, other, some have died. Let me, sorry, let me start again. Just, just um, refocus. I think in the case of a situation where many thousands may have died, for example, as in a recent earthquake, yet one survives. Obviously, there is this very important question, did God choose to save that one? If so, what was wrong with all the others? And I think that the natural Christian instinct, which I believe to be correct here, is indeed to speak of God saving that child. Not because God wanted any others to perish, but because God, as it were, chose to save that one. And I think that the whole language here, which we find, for example, in Augustine, is that of God wanting to do something in the midst of a world which is not perfect. And again, the Christian vision of the world is that this is not the way God wants the world to be. It's the idea of an imperfect, a fallen world, a world of suffering, where things happen which God does not want to happen. And the key point, again, I want to stress is that I do not believe it represents any failure on God's part, that this is a world of suffering, a world of death, a world where things happen which we know God would not want to happen, and at the same time be able to say that in some way God is able to bring some good out of these disasters, for example, by saving a person there, by doing something else there. Well, I think we're just going to have to leave it at that because I, I, I think we're never going to... Okay. Um, Resolve that. That's great, and I'm, I'm glad we've really covered that. But could we just ask three points? I'm just really. We live in difficult times with suicide bombers around the world, and uh, time and again, one gets the feeling that the people who perpetrate these atrocious acts are absolutely convinced that they're right. And this is not so much a, a political decision to, uh, to do something for, well, maybe it's partly a political decision to do something for a political cause that they believe in, I'm sure it is, uh, but, but also the, the total conviction that you're right to the point where you're actually prepared to kill and die for it is something which even brave soldiers who win the Victoria Cross would, would hesitate to, to, to do. It seems to me that it's faith that gives people the ultimate courage. They're often called cowards. Of course they're not cowards. Courage is the, is, is, is the right word to, to do these things. And that alarms me very much because I'm accustomed to verbal argument. I'm accustomed to saying, right, we disagree about something. Let's sit down and talk about it. But if the other person is so absolutely convinced he's right that he won't, not only will he not talk about it, he'll actually blow himself up and me because he's so convinced. I mean, don't you see that your faith is obviously not, not in, in that category, but faith as something that is taught to children, something that they are taught to believe because they believe because they believe, isn't that a dangerous thing to teach children? I think um, faith is a very dangerous thing. Whether one has faith there is a God whether one has faith there is not a God. And I would want to say, I think in agreement with you and at the same point diverging from you, that faith can really inspire people to do some dreadful things. But I need to make the point very clearly that faith in God has inspired people to do bad things, as has faith in the belief that getting rid of belief in God would be a good thing for humanity. And I think there's perhaps something more true about human nature here than specifically about religion. I think that one of the things I see in human nature 
is that a worldview, an ideology, can inspire great acts of generosity, or indeed great acts of charity, and also great acts of violence. I see that in religion. I see the great acts of charity. I'm grateful for those. I see acts of violence, which I deplore. But in fairness, having studied atheism during the 20th century, I've seen both things there as well. I think the real question we're confronted with as human beings is simply, if worldviews do inspire people, can we please make them do good things instead of using violence? And maybe I'm just dreaming there, but it seems to me there's something about human nature which makes us go and do bad things in the name of something that might possibly be very good. Yes, I mean, I think we largely agree there, and I, I, I think I would only add that faith itself, I would want, want people to say, I might be wrong. My, my faith is shakeable. I, 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 I could be argued out of my position. Now, when you talked about uh, the dangers of faith in the desirability of getting rid of religion, I can only think you must have been thinking of Stalin there. Or, I mean, I, um, I can't think of anybody else who, who's... Um, I mean, somebody like, like Stalin. Do, do you think that it was Stalin's faith in there not being a god that drove him to do those hideous things, I'd be very surprised if it was. I think Stalin saw uh, religion as being a threat to him. Yes. Ideologically, he was uh, a Marxist-Leninist, which meant that religion was seen as a cause of many evils. And certainly in the Soviet state schools of the period, religion was taught as a dogma. And I think you and I will probably agree that anything that's taught as a dogma really has the potential to do some very bad things. Yes. I think it's a little bit unfair on atheists to blame them for Stalin, um, or and still more for Hitler, who actually wasn't an atheist. But um, even though Stalin was an atheist, what, what he was was a, was a dogmatic Marxist. Uh, and um, I, I sort of feel it's rather incidental that he happened to be an atheist, whereas it's very much not incidental that the suicide bombers are religious. They really believe that it's the will of God that they should do it. They really believe that if they, are, if they die as martyrs, they will have a fast track to paradise, um, which must be a terrific incentive if you believe it, as they undoubtedly do. I mean, the author Sam Harris made the rather clever point, I thought, that it's easy to understand what's going on in the world. All you have to do is realize that these people, he's talking about Osama bin Laden and, and similar people, they really actually believe what they say they believe. And once you can grasp that, everything else follows. I think the atheist critique of religion for doing violent things was very easy in the 19th century. We look back at the Spanish Inquisition and things like that. But I think we stand at the dawn of the 21st century, and we have seen what institutionalized atheism did in the 20th century. That doesn't prove there is a God, doesn't prove there's not a God. I think it simply proves that as human beings, we need to be intensely responsible about any ideology and its impact on the way in which we live. There need to be limits, and I think that's one of the most important outcomes of our discussion this morning. Yes, I, I mean, I, I agree with a lot of that. I, I, I must object once again to the phrase institutionalized atheism. I mean, Stalin was, 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 was pushing institutionalized atheism. Marxism. He happened to be an atheist. Hitler was pushing, well, goodness knows, I mean, some sort of vague sub-Wagnerian private religion of his own. Uh, he never actually formally renounced his Roman Catholicism, and he sometimes invoked it uh, in his more virulently anti-Semitic speeches. But I wouldn't wish to claim Hitler was religious, nor would I wish to, to claim Hitler or Stalin were institutionalized atheism. It is certainly true that there are other ideologies which have caused hideous deaths and destruction and torture and are deeply, deeply evil. Faith in the wrong hands is to be added to that list. Atheism is not because it was incidental to what Hitler and Stalin did, not a deeply um, integral part of their worldview. I hear your objections to the phrase institutionalized atheism, but in response, I would want to say that atheism is not a sort of add-on belief for a Marxist. It's core. It's a central explanatory theme, and it also leads to the Marxist program of wanting to eliminate religion by force, 
when it did not decline as the theory said it would. So we may have a different difference here about what words we use, but I would simply want to say again that the history of the 20th century shows that even atheism, which can be benign, even positive in some contexts, can end up mimicking the worst of religion in its certain contexts. And therefore, again, I say the real issue is human nature. When we see a worldview that inspires us, that makes us think we must do something, Sometimes we do some very good things, but I'm afraid history suggests also we do some very bad things. Yes. Perhaps we might invoke um, George Orwell and the idea of the thought police and thought crime. Uh, when society chooses to police actions like thieving and murder, then that's part of the law that we all understand. We should all of us be very, very worried when society starts to police thought and that, of course, is what Stalin did and what Hitler did. So they were in the business of controlling people to the extent of actually uh, imprisoning them, killing them, because of, of what they thought. Uh, faith at its worst can do that. Faith at its best obviously can't. There is a sense in which the sort of rational discussing way of doing things, which is what we've been doing this morning, is, I believe, antithetical to faith that is the kind of thing, um, and, and, and the, 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 the faith that I believe it's antithetical to was the kind of thing that Stalin would have understood, not that he was religious, but or perhaps his early training as a seminarian might have given him the idea that controlling thought was the right kind of thing to do, and I think we should simply agree that thought police in, in all that that implies is deeply evil and deeply wicked and can have terrible consequences, and what we must try and do is to enter into reasoned discussion together. Yeah, I'll buy it. <coughs> See, I, the thing about science and faith being that, that's, that I can only go all, the, that, all that stuff about God being too complex and things. Uh, that's where I, I would come from. Go that deep, I just want to, I'd just like, I, I could give you just a, a question from you and a quick answer as a way into that other discussion. Okay. That other discussion kind of came out quite in a, quite a, quite a loose way. And okay. I mean, anything like that. Yes. Okay. Not the punch, not the punch. Okay. So I'm punch. Do you think science and faith are incompatible? No, and I think the history of the whole interaction of science and religion shows that this idea, there's perpetual warfare between them, is simply historically unjustified. What you can show is at times they are in conflict, and at times they work quite well together. And it seems to me that there's an obligation on all of us to try and make sure that they work together well in the future, as at times they have done in the past. You've written that atheism is in decline, is in twilight. Uh, what do you mean by that? Why, d why do you think that? When I was researching a book called The Twilight of Atheism, one of the things I noticed is that its, its appeal is shaped largely by cultural factors. Where belief in God is seen to be a bad thing, atheism begins to flourish. We seem to be entering a phase in Western culture where that core belief seems to be eroded. There's a new interest in postmodern culture about spirituality. And what I see happening, and I don't say this makes it right or anything like that, what I see happening is people beginning to talk instead about spirituality instead of atheism. It's particularly evident amongst younger people, and that made me wonder, amongst many other things, whether atheism actually was beginning to lose the appeal it once had in a more modernist culture. What about the sort of spiritual atheist, if I could coin that phrase, somebody like Einstein, who was a deeply spiritual man, but who didn't actually believe in a supernatural God. Well, it's a very interesting debate we could have about whether uh, Einstein actually was an atheist. Certainly, he was not a conventional theist, but I think I would want to raise questions about whether he could be said to be an atheist as a result. 
But that example aside, I think I can certainly agree that there are many atheists who feel that it is natural or proper for human beings to explore a more spiritual side. I have no difficulty with that. But it seems to me there is an inconsistency there between a fundamentally atheist viewpoint, particularly uh, a Marxist viewpoint that stresses the material side of life, and this growing interest in the spiritual side of things, which we're seeing all around us. I would call myself a spiritual atheist in that I do not believe in anything supernatural, but I have a deep reverence and wonder at the mysteries of the universe and a desire to understand them, while at the same time feeling that supernatural explanations for them are never going to be helpful. I think we have a very interesting disagreement then on what the word spiritual means, because certainly I know many atheists like you who will talk about a sense of awe in the presence of nature. Others would say, no, this, it is more than just a human response to nature. There is something there which is eliciting a response, and they will use the language of spirituality or the spiritual to actually mean something that is not simply in nature, but actually goes beyond it, even though they wouldn't use traditional Christian language at all to refer to it. I find that development very interesting. I'm not sure where it's going to take us. Thank you. Just one question for Richard, yeah. uh, and if I, if I just fr phrase it to him, and then we'll see where we go. I've enjoyed reading your writings very much, and one of the things I've noticed is that uh, in your writings we have what we might call a double critique of religion. There is a sort of intellectual critique. In your view, the, the religions do not have adequate evidential foundations. But alongside that, I occasionally detect flashes of anger, that this is something that is bad, that is evil. The world would be a better place if things were to change. And so I suppose my question really is this, why the anger? What is it that really makes you cross about the way religious people think or behave? I think two possible answers to that. One would be relating to the evidential point first. I think that religion teaches people to stop questioning. I'm sure you disagree with that, but the way I see it, uh, it is such a privilege to be born at all. It's a very improbable event that either of us were born. We have the privilege of being in this universe for a few decades, and during that time, it is an enormous privilege to be able to understand something about the universe in which we live, why we're here, why we were ever born, where we come from. And I think that is such a wonderful thing to be able to do, that I am hostile, I can get angry about competing accounts which seem to me to not encourage that kind of questioning, but instead to say, this is how it is, it's all written in a holy book, it was written 2,000 years ago and that's the end of it. Uh, I, I think that deprives people, I think that is such a, um, a, a belittling, a, a, a demeaning view of the, of the universe, and I think it's tragic that children are brought up with that when they could be brought up in a more open-minded way. So that's one reason for the anger. The other reason we've touched upon, it, it, it is that I do think that faith, unsupported by evidence, is a lethal weapon. Not it doesn't have to be, of course it doesn't have to be, but it can be. It's a weapon because possibly unscrupulous people can get hold of often young men and use them as weapons, use them as human bombs. And the only reason they can be deployed as human bombs is that they have been brought up from childhood on onwards to believe implicitly, without question, that whatever the particular religion is, it's, the details don't, don't matter. The, the, the point is that they do believe that it is the will of God that they should detonate themselves and blow up a busload of people or blow up a skyscraper in New York. I don't think that any kind of reasoned argument would do that to people. And so I believe that religion, religious faith, is an enormously powerful psychological weapon. It isn't always used for the bad, of course, but the fact that it can be used for the bad makes me want to cut it off at the roots, and at very least to stop the inculcation into children of the idea that there is something virtuous in faith. 
I am very concerned, so I suppose this, we could call this a third reason for hostility, I'm very concerned with the way children coming into the world innocent and knowing nothing are taken over by the religion of whatever culture they happen to be born into. It doesn't happen to everybody, but it's very common. And so you see children being labelled in Northern Ireland. This is a Catholic child, this is a Protestant child. With all that that implies in the really appalling cultural circumstances due to the history of Northern Ireland. I would much rather say this is a child. Perhaps you could say this is a child of Catholic parents or this is a child of Protestant parents. But to tie a label around a tiny child, this is a Catholic child, when the child is clearly too young to know what it thinks about the transubstantiation or whatever it is that, that differentiates Catholics from Protestants. And it's no argument to say in reply that the, the conflict in Northern Ireland is all about politics and historical grievances. Of course it is. But the labelling of children, generation after generation after generation, down the generations, only exacerbates the problem and is bound to do so.